awesome. Hello. Hello. Hi, Nina. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thank you for having me on this. Great, awesome. Thank you for coming. Um, so as you can see, we've got like a chat going. Everyone's saying hi. Um, just a reminder for everyone listening uh, that you can add things into the Q&A part of the chat um, if you have questions as we go along. Um, but yeah, Olga, I just uh, want to know if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how you got to where you are now, and um, sort of how you started in music production. Sure. So um, I grew up in Berlin and Scotland. So I went to high school in Scotland and was really into my music. I had a brilliant music teacher and I was in bands as a teenager as well. Um, so my plan A was to be a drummer in a girl punk band. And my cool. plan B was to be a sound engineer. And I went to college in Glasgow to study an HND in, it's called music technology or something at the time. And while I was doing that, it sort of became apparent that the engineering was definitely going to be my plan A. Um, I was really into it, really passionate about it. So I did two years at that college um, and then started knocking on doors of recording studios. And I mean, people would just kind of laugh in my face, basically, um, because it's so, such a hard industry to get into, I think, without having any contacts and having just come out of a two year college course, no work experience, really. Um, people just weren't interested. So I did the, I applied for the Tonmeister course at Surrey University, um, which is again, similar to some of you guys here. It's a music, sound engineering, music um, and sound recording degree. And the important thing about that course for me was that they did a year in industry. So, cause I didn't really know how to get into the industry. I didn't know anyone that worked in a studio that seemed to me like the only way that I would actually be able to sort of get my foot in the door. And I was lucky enough to do my placement year at Air Studios in London. Um, so I worked there for a year as a runner, um, which means you're basically, you're getting teas and coffees, you do a bit on reception, you get people's photocopies, you know, any kind of dog's body work that needs doing. And also obviously being on a lot of sessions, I would be the second assistant on a big film session, Back in those days, it involved running backup tape machines and things like that. Um, so I had my year there, and towards the end of that, they actually offered me a job for when I graduated. So I came back as a full-time runner after I finished my degree, and then just slowly worked my way up to being an assistant engineer. So that's a role with a bit more responsibility in the studio. You're often running Pro Tools, setting up sessions for visiting engineers. And then about... Nine years into that, I think it was, about 2013, I finally went freelance to be an engineer and producer um, on my own. And sort of towards the end of my assistant career, I'd gone on to do bits of engineering in-house, perhaps taking over when the main engineer wasn't available. Um, so you sort of slowly work your way up, but it was kind of about 10 years from first setting foot in the door at Air Studios to actually going freelance as an engineer. And I've now been freelance for, what year are we in, 2021, for about eight years now. Um, and I work with bands. I've worked with Coldplay, Dua Lipa. Um, I also work on a lot of film and TV scores. So I worked on, last year, I worked on the music for The Crown on Netflix and for Doctor Who. So it's quite a broad range of stuff that I work on. That's really cool. Wow, amazing. Um... Yeah, I, that actually leads into one of my questions. Um, so you've worked with big uh, names in like pop and rock music with Coldplay and Dua Lipa, um, but you've also worked with composers and different, um, just all all across the board, different genres. So I was wondering how working with those genres different, differentiate and um, what some of the challenges might be with each one of them. Um, so I think there's differences and there's also similarities. So in film and TV, it tends to be a bit more ordered. So the composer will write the music generally on their own or with an assistant and working really closely with the director. So by the time the music actually gets to the engineer, there's quite a clear picture of what it needs to sound like. Certainly in terms of timing, it's all mapped out. Um, everything has got a click track. There's probably a really comprehensive demo of the music that's already been done in Logic. So it's really, really clear what you're supposed to record, which bits you need to record with live instruments, 
And then when it comes to mixing, there's also usually a very clear brief of basically most of the time it's kind of make it better than the demo, but not wildly different from the demo. So, and because of that, and again, it, on film and TV, you're part of a larger production. So the music isn't everything. There's like film, there's the editing, there's post-production, sound effects, the final sound mix, all of that stuff. And the music's just one small part of it. So in terms of time and budget, there's a really tight schedule that you just have to fit into. So in that way, it's quite predictable. Once it's been booked, you've got X amount of hours to record X amount of music and then X amount of days to mix it in. And it's really quite clear what people are expecting from it at the end, hopefully, um, most of the time. And with rock and roll stuff, it tends to be a bit more open ended. I mean, obviously, again, budgets will usually be set. Um, but you might not know when you go into a studio whether you're going to do eight tracks or 10 tracks with a band. Um, and I guess particularly with the bands where the budget is not as limited, you might be in for three weeks, but then they might add another two weeks because they want to do something or they might try different mixers to mix something. Um, so that kind of open endedness is probably the main difference between doing band stuff and working with film and TV. Um, I would say also in terms of the actual session, obviously a band session, again, is a bit more flowing. You might try different things out on the day, whereas on an orchestral session, you might move a soloist's mic a few foot to the left or something or reposition one player, but it's unlikely you're going to really turn things on their head or record something completely random in the middle of the orchestral session. Whereas in a band session, of course, you might do a bunch, bunch of really different things and someone might come up with some crazy ideas of just recording things differently, recording a random instrument, bringing in a completely different player that wasn't on the list in the morning, all sorts of things like that. Um, but I think the thing that's actually you can have in common is being quite organized from the engineering side of things. So in orchestral sessions, it kind of makes sense because you've got a lot of microphones, you've got really strict session times, so you kind of need to be really organized. But I think for band sessions, if on the engineering side of things, you're as organized as you can be, and on the production side of things, keeping notes of everything, it means that when things get free flowing and people get creative and want to try new things, it's one, it's really quick for you to actually make things work technically because you know where everything is. And it's also really handy to then keep a track of stuff so that when one month later someone says to you, oh, do you remember that take that we did on like that random electric guitar we found at the back of the cupboard that we never used? If you've got a note of what they're actually talking about, it's so handy and people really appreciate it. So I think that's something that's quite in common is being organized for both types of music. Right, cool. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so also, like, what would some production techniques uh, be that you practice? Um, I guess it might depend on uh, who you're working with, but what are some production techniques that help you uh, stand out as a, as a sound engineer and make you unique? Um, I don't know if there's anything that makes me particularly stand out. I Sometimes I try things and I discover something new. I mean, just the other few weeks ago, I was doing a string project in Studio One at Air. And the kind of brief was make it quite like the Lost Shadow Puppets and kind of quite vintage and grungy sounding. So I got a pair of um, AA44, these vintage um, RCA reproduction ribbon mics, these really big ribbon mics that you probably see in a lot of photos of kind of 1950s recordings. Um, and I put them kind of pointing out over the orchestra on the left and right. And I'd never done that bef that particular placement of those mics before. Um, and it was just for that one session, but I really liked the sound of it. It got really brilliant bottom end, a lot of warmth. And I've ended up using that as a kind of, as part of my standard setup now for strings in that room. So it's more often, I guess, you sort of, you try something and you discover it and you kind of keep it. And then you might, go back to some of your other things that you used to do and maybe listen to something and sort of go, hmm, not too sure about that. Maybe I won't do that next time and I'll try something different. So it's kind of, it's always evolving rather than being one specific thing, I think. Right, yeah, awesome. Um, so what are some of the main lessons you've learned during your career that have improved your, your methods and also just your career in general? Um, so one piece of advice that I got given by Jeff Foster, who is chief engineer at Air Studios, 
was always trust your ears. I think it's really valuable. I think if something's not sounding right, whether it's musically not right or technically not right, even if it looks like it right, you've you think you've plugged it in right or somebody's insisting they're playing it right. If it doesn't sound right, it probably isn't right. So do trust your ears, I think. Have faith in in your experience and in your abilities. I think that's a good one. And the other one is just, I think, kind of, I think someone might have told me this at uni, actually. Um, be nice to everybody from the cleaner to the CEO because, you know, it costs nothing. And I think a huge part of the job is just getting on with people. And it doesn't really matter who you are. It's just like the general getting on with people, being nice to people, creating a pleasant atmosphere and that ma makes people want to be around you and work with you. I think that's really important. Yeah, definitely. That's really helpful. Um, it's always nice to be to be nice to anybody, no matter who you're working with. Yeah. Um, let's see. What are some of the biggest challenges that you've had to overcome as your as your um, career has grown and, and so from the very beginning, I guess, as well? Um, I guess, I mean, at the beginning, you sort of walk into the studio and it can be quite daunting when you've got no idea how anything works, really. You might have done some sessions at college, but when you go into the real world, people might use the equipment differently or it might just be a completely different situation. So I guess it's, um, I think it's having faith that you will learn it is quite important because, you know, walking into a studio age 20 and having done a couple of sessions at uni where I didn't really know how the desk worked. I'd kind of, you know, just copy what other people were doing. Um, to then get to the point where you're actually planning sessions and in charge of sessions. Um, when I first walked into the studio, I had no concept as to how that knowledge would get into my brain. Um, and I think it's just sort of keeping the faith that it will, you will get there. It's not rocket science. I know we're all called engineers, but, you know, it's basically just learning a little bit of signal flow and, just absorbing the knowledge around you, learning from other people. Cool, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, nice. Um, so I have a question from Faith Benson, who uh, sent over some questions previously to us. Um, and she wants to know what your five top tips would be for starting a career as a producer or an engineer. Five top tips. Um, well, I, I think that being nice to people is really important. Okay. Right. Um, I think be prepared to work long hours. Um, Perfect. I think sort of don't don't present things. Actually, I think this is quite an important one that I've kind of learned over the years. Don't present things that you are not happy with. So, if you're not sure about the direction of something, um, get it as good as you can. Either like ask for more clarity, more information. How does your client want it? Um, but if that isn't clear and you're not sure about something, just get it as good as you can. Don't sort of have to go, oh, well, I wasn't sure, so I've kind of half done it. I think never present something that you're not happy with in yourself. Um, that's three, isn't it? So I need two more. I think also, like, no matter how kind of stressful a situation can be, say you're mixing and you're just getting loads and loads of comments back and it's not right, like, one, your, your bit of music will be mixed in... 24 hours time whenever it is whenever the deadline is there will be something you will have completed it no matter how many notes have gone through and you know we are just making music we're doing something that's fun that's enjoyable even if it's stressful we're not actually responsible for kind of you know we're not performing surgery the worst thing that could happen if we don't do a good mix is that that person won't use us anymore and obviously that's not nice but I think it just keeps things in perspective you know don't get too stressed we are just making music Oh, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so I have a question from Alex Dai uh, that just came through. So I'm going to bring him up to the platform so that he can ask you the question in person. Cool. Hi, Olga. Hi, Alex. Uh, I was just wondering what advice you could give to young engineers home to find work in some of the big London studios like Church or Air. Um, so I think they, they sometimes advertise, so definitely keep an eye on their websites. And email obviously email the studio managers um you know you might often just get a pro forma response saying we'll keep your cv on file um but i think just keep keep getting in touch with people also if you know someone that works at the big studios or someone who's got a session there i think if you can 
go go in and shadow them for a day obviously like mm-hmm. right now in covid times they don't you know most places only have the absolute minimum number of people but you know we're not going to be in the situation forever so i would say any opportunity you get to attend a session at those places i think that's really helpful because then you've got again something to write to the studio manager about perhaps yeah. again if people are working in the office again you can pop in and say hello um and just make yourself useful and then again if you've done a day there at least you kind of know your way around so you might be a useful kind of spare pair of hands um i know some of the studios often have some freelancers on, on call for if they need an extra pair of hands so i think you know just keep keep trying keep getting in touch with people and trying to get in with kind of any any avenue that you know to get your foot in the door basically mm-hmm. um, and yeah keep trying Brilliant. And what platform would you recommend trying to find contacts on or through? Um, I mean, just I would, you know, like use your Facebook friends. If you know someone who's got a set who's going, oh, I've got a session there next week and they're a mate, then, you know, that's a opportunity to see if you can blag your way in. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess just whatever your networks are, I don't think it needs to be any particular social media platform. It's just your own personal networks. Um, I mean, I know some of the studio managers are absolutely don't go on social media at all. Some of them are all over it. So I think it's more about just utilizing your personal networks and getting the best out of that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Sure. Alex, um, I've also got a question from um, from a student named Joey. Um, when starting up a career, would you recommend taking any work um, and doing a whole range of things to boost yourself or just focusing on one career path that you know you're best at? I think that kind of depends, really. Um, I think if you're not 100 percent sure, then I think it's really important to try different things. I think if you absolutely know you don't want to be a composer, then there's probably not that much point in spending too much time on it. That said, I think you can still get good contacts out of it. So say you want to be a film score engineer, but a composer asks you to help out printing some logic stems, then that's super, super valuable because you're making a contact with that composer. So I think I would just sort of assess it on a case by case basis as to whether it's useful. And I think, again, again, it depends on how much time you have, what your other commitments are. Um, But I think it's probably useful having an idea of what you want to get out of it rather than just doing it randomly. Um, that doesn't mean you need to stick to one thing, but I think if you have a clear in your mind what you want to get out of it, that will probably help you decide on what is useful to pursue and what isn't. Perfect, yeah, great. Um, let's see, I've got another question from <clears throat> um, from Matt, so I'm going to see if he wants to come up um, and ask you the question in person as well. Oh, yeah, you okay? Awesome. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Matt. Yeah. Right. Um, so with the expanding market, um, sorry, with the market expanding to social media and internet, how vital do you think um, it is to have a social media brand uh, and using that to expand your business? I think it depends. I think I would say if you're looking to join the industry at that entry level and learn from somebody else, so like learn from another producer or be an assistant in a recording studio, I think it's not important at all because I think they don't really want you to be a pop star or an influencer. They just want you to make a good cup of tea and mm. be helpful and learn stuff. Obviously, if you're going down your own route as an independent producer and you're just doing it yourself, then I think it can be really valuable. So it kind of depends, again, what stage you're at and what you're trying to achieve. Mm, of course. So you would you would say that in the beginning, it's it's um, more vital to um, create contacts and look out for these small opportunities in, in the industry. Definitely. I mean, unless it depends if you're an artist and you're like doing your own thing and you don't want to work for someone else, you don't want to go and like work in a studio or shadow somebody, then that's fine. But I think if you do want to actually go and get trained by other people, then I think it's much more important to nurture those contacts than to kind of get an attention grabbing social media because that's not mm. what people are looking for. Mm. OK, that's great. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, so also you wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the music production guild as well and your involvement with that. Do you mind, um, explaining a little bit about what the music production guild is and what your role is with that? 
Yeah, so um, I'm on the executive of the Music Producers Guild. We're like we're a trade body for music producers and recording studios and engineers, mixers, mastering engineers. So um, we we're a community. In, in non-COVID times, we used to have events, and we have we've had awards running for I think twelve or thirteen years now, where we recognise production, engineering, and mixing talent. Um, and so it's a bit different from normal music awards because it's really focused on the behind the scenes talent. Um, but in COVID times, it's actually become even, I mean, we've always done a bit of this kind of talking to the government about the things that the industry needs. But in COVID times, obviously that side of it has just gone a bit crazy. Um, so mm. we've been really involved in pushing for support for self-employed people because a lot of our members are self-employed and working with the government and public health to get safe working guidelines for studios so that's kind of been a lot of our work um and to enable people to keep on working and keep on working safely um so that's kind of what we do we do a lot of things but it's basically kind of representing engineers and producers and another part of it is again i think i'm sure a lot of the people on this call will be really aware of things like the gender imbalance in the music industries, particularly behind the scenes in studios and other aspects of diversity. Uh, studios are still very white. We, we still don't see very many disabled people in kind of high-end production positions. So that's, again, something that the MPG are really committed to working on and changing. Um, in 2018, I think we had 18, we had 12.5% female members so oh, cool. yeah so i mean it's you know you see all sorts of percentages banded about sometimes it's two percent or five percent i mean 12.5 percent is a terrible terrible statistic compared to the general population but it's definitely it's twice what it was two years before that and i imagine now it's probably even higher so it's small steps but we're definitely committed to kind of making the music industry um the production part of the music industry more diverse that's really great. Yeah, there's not a lot of programs like that, uh, but they're slowly growing, which is really good. Um, that also kind of leads into a question from Corbin. Um, so I'll have him bring and uh, come up to the stage because it's on the same kind of thing. Hi there. Can you hear me? Awesome. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, it does. It leads in perfectly. Um, my, my question was just sort of as as someone that's very much involved with like the more political side of the industry. Um, how do you feel that we as artists and producers um, can sort of get involved with that side and, and be more sort of what, what kind of ways of activism are there that we could engage in um, just following sort of the developments in the creative sector, like after recent developments with COVID and of course Brexit, i.e. Yeah. that visa free tours uh, yeah. are for being rejected and things like that. Like what, what can we do to, to help with that from our um, point? I mean, I would suggest joining the MPG um, because that's kind of we're there to present more of the producers. Obviously, Musicians Union present that represent yeah. musicians, um, and just e you know, email those organisations, tell them your views. Um, certainly, at the MPG, you know, we get emails from members going, "Oh, you know, my studio hasn't received this type of re support, and we should be eligible for it. What are you doing about it?" Hmm. Um, obviously, the visa-free touring is might. You might not think that it affects people in studios directly, but indirectly, I think it's going to be massive. Mm. Artists are missing out on that bit of income. They're not going to want to spend it in studios. If EU artists aren't able to come to the UK to tour, then they're not going to bother just coming for one session, for one recording session. So it's all like really interlinked. Um, we also, the MPG is part of a larger trade body called UK Music that represents all different parts of the music industry. And again, that's where we feed in our views, our members' views um, about things like that. And I mean, at the moment, it just seems like there's non-stop politics going on. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> there's too much news right now. Mm. But yeah, definitely, I would suggest, um, I mean, for everyone here, like, just, you can get on the MPG mailing list, it's free, and then you can look at the different types of membership that are available. Um, but yeah, I'd absolutely recommend talking to your membership organizations about things like that. Brilliant, thank you very much for answering. Cool. Thank you. Awesome, yeah, that's um, a really cool program. I'm excited to look more into that. Um, so I have a couple of other questions as well from Faith, um, asking what the benefits are of having like 
um, commercial students, or sorry, not students, studios over like a high-end studio that you set up and um, what kind of the benefits are versus and in between those two types of studios? Sure, so I've, I've worked in both and you can get private studios that are incredibly high-end that are better than a lot of commercial studios. So I don't think there is, in terms of the technology, there's any difference. I mean, I would say, I guess there aren't any private orchestral scoring stages of the scale of Abbey Road or Air that I know of. But other than that, for you know, there's some really big private band studios, for example, um, and there's some, you know, commercial studios of all sizes, obviously. So I think technically, I don't think there is any difference when you're talking about non-orchestral studios. I think the benefit for someone learning in a commercial studio is that you get a bunch of different people coming through. So you get a chance to learn from all sorts of different engineers and producers. Um, whereas at a private studio, you might only get one artist and one producer that you're working with. Um, but again, they're all different. A lot of the private studios might also then hire themselves out for commercial things for a part of the time. I know Maloko manage a lot of studios for producers that might own the studio and use it for their own projects and then hire it out commercially for the rest of the time. So I think the line isn't as strict as it perhaps it once was like studios. Right, great, yeah. Um, awesome, I was, uh, she was also wondering, um, you mentioned before to uh, being organized is really important because uh, there's so many different takes you might be doing during different sessions. Um, so, and you also probably have a lot of projects on like at the same time. So in what ways do you balance your, um, your life with all of these different projects going on at the same time? And do you focus on one project at a time before starting a new project or do multiple at once? I tend to have projects that are kind of linear rather than a bunch of them at the same time but there's definitely points where you might be doing a few days on one then a few days on another then a few days on one so it does happen sometimes um i mean i'm really lucky that i have management that sort out my diary because i think it would be a nightmare if i had to do it myself so i would say definitely if you're in a position to either if you're really good at doing your own diary or if you're in a position to have someone help with diary and bookings, I think that helps with the kind of headspace of being organized. It means I can focus on the project and the kind of technical organization for that, but I don't need to then think about diary and scheduling and when dates move and when dates cancel because, um, yeah, dates change a lot and bookings take a lot. It takes a long time before bookings confirm as well, so you might not know whether you're definitely doing a project until quite close to it. Okay, yeah. Cool. Great. Awesome. Um, uh, so I was also wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about Air Studios as well. And um, you talked a little bit how you reached that internship, but sort of like what uh, Air Studios is like and if they still do sort of opportunities like that, uh, different internships and whatnot. Yeah, so um, I mean, I started in 2003. And a lot of it, I would say, hasn't really changed. I mean, something that was really special about AIR was that it had a real family atmosphere and really low turnover of staff. So there's people that are working there now that worked there when AIR Studios was at Oxford Circus, um, just above where Top Shop is. So, you know, it's a really close-knit community of assistants and engineers and management. And I don't think that's really changed. Obviously, the technology's changed a bit over the years. Um, most of the assistants that we were all assisting together have now gone on to be freelance engineers themselves. But um, the kind of, the atmosphere is the same. Um, and for those that don't know AIR, it's a, it was started by Sir George Martin. It is now situated in a converted church in Hampstead. And it's got a large orchestral room, which in non-COVID times can hold about 90 players. At the moment, they're doing about 50. Um, and it's also got a band tracking room, there's Studio One, which can hold about 20 musicians in normal times. And um, so 20 orchestral musicians or, you know, be a really great band tracking room. And then it's got a couple of mix rooms and a mastering suite as well. So it's quite, you know, it's a big studio. Um, and you get all sorts of different genres of music. Again, probably over the years, probably fewer band sessions 
um, and more film and TV, I think, um, especially because a few orchestral studios in London have closed. So there's a bit more of that work coming in. And I guess some of the bands have built their own studios, which back in the day, they couldn't really record it in their own studios. So that's kind of changed a bit. But yeah, it's still a really great variety of music. And, and there's also a great tech department. So everything works, everything gets fixed, um, which is a real luxury. And as an engineer now coming in, um, the assistants there are amazing. You know, they're, they're all engineers in their own right. And I think the same can be said if you go to Abbey Road as well. Uh, they're so knowledgeable, so quick, so organized. Um, and it's a real luxury working at those places. Nice, yeah, cool. Um, that sounds like a really interesting studio with the, um, yeah. the huge orchestral rooms and everything. Um, I guess some more fun questions would be, uh, you've worked with a lot of like higher end um, or some people in the industry that are considered like the top 1% and then probably some other, um, some other musicians and artists that are maybe more independent or lower in the, in the um, ladder, I guess. So what is some of the, what are some of the main differences between um, working with a very high end, like a, higher end client i don't really like like how i phrased that um versus somebody who's a little bit more independent um i think the with the really established artists um i guess they i mean the, the budget is the obvious thing but that's kind of a given you expect you know someone like coldplay is going to have a different budget to an unsigned band obviously um I think for the really established artists i think they're really experienced so you don't you know, they make good decisions, they know what they're doing, they're experienced in not just writing good songs, but in the craft of making a record. Um, and the same with the film composers that are very experienced, they're not just good at writing a, a nice theme or good at orchestration, they're also experienced in the process of make, writing a film score and getting it recorded and all the politics of dealing with all the input from directors and producers, and they're really experienced at handling that. And I think with the new, less experienced artists or less experienced composers, I think my role might be to bring some of that experience that perhaps they haven't got, um, whether it's kind of steering, say, on a film session, if the director's kind of panicking about something, um, you know, making everyone feel a bit more confident, um, knowing which things because a director might not might be quite inexperienced as well so you can tell them okay this bit we can change in the mix this bit this concern that you have why don't we address it like this um and because i've been on so many sessions i've seen these comments in these situations before i can kind of address them without freaking out whereas obviously if you're the composer and it's your first big scoring session and you're under a lot of pressure you might find it harder to address those things um, and again, I think with bands, for example, they might have written a great song and they're there ready to record, but they're not experienced in recording. So you, you might suggest how they might want to record it, whether to do it to click or whether to do it in sections. You know, you might have, put, have some input on what tempos they play at, um, all of that sort of thing. Whereas I think with the more experienced artists, you would probably need to do less of that because they'd have a really good idea of how they wanted to do it. and because they've done it loads of times, they also, they also know what works for them. So I'd say that was probably the main difference, just experience, I think. Right, yeah, that's really cool. Um, sounds about, sounds good. <clears throat> um, I have another question from Matt that just came in um, and I'll mm -hmm. just read it out this time. Uh, he said, if you could go back in time, what are some things that you would do differently? And which of those things would you not recommend uh, beginners do in this industry? <laughs> um... I remember we did a film session when I was assisting. Uh, we recorded it on two inch tape and I rewound to the wrong spot and wiped over a cue. So I'd probably do that differently. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think, I mean, in ser all seriousness, I don't think I've got any major regret regrets. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's all music. If you, you know, the biggest mistake you can make is fail to record something. Um, occasionally it happens, uh, nobody dies. Um, and, you know, I think also if you think you've messed something up, actually, it's not that bad at the end of the day. You know, I'm sure that like when I was an assistant, I'd maybe like plug a microphone in wrong. 
and then we'd have to replug it. Like it sounds like no big deal, but at the time I'd be like mortified that I plugged in the mic wrong. Um, and I think, you know, generally, as long as you learn from your mistakes, I think that's all people look for when you're starting off. They don't, you know, they expect you to make mistakes, but they expect you to learn from them. And I think that's the main thing, really. Right. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so I've got another question as well from Faith asking, um, so what questions are you really asked the most? Um, and is your answer always the same? I'm assuming through like um, both interviews and, and mentorships and stuff like that. That's a good question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, what questions am I asked the most? I mean, I guess one is like, what's your most memorable session? Um, and I do kind of often talk about um, doing a session for Sir George Martin, doing the last ever Beatles recording, recording a string arrangement, just because it felt really special. Um, and I do always give that answer, but I think that is because it is, it was such a special session. Um, what other questions am I asked a lot? I kind of sometimes get asked about whether I found it hard being a woman, being a woman in a male dominated industry and what the kind of barriers are. Um, I don't think my question, my, my answer is generally the same, like the gist of it is the same. I would say when I was starting out, I didn't find it particularly hard. I found it in some ways it was an advantage because there weren't, at that time, there were really few women around working in studios. And so I was perhaps a bit more memorable. People might remember my, were perhaps more likely to remember my name than one of the male assistants who was probably called Chris or John. And there were probably about 100 of them in London, around about the same age with the same name, white guys with brown hair. Um, yeah. But I guess moving on, you know, I'm sure there, were, there might have been some people that perhaps didn't want to work with a female engineer, but they obviously wouldn't say that to my face. So I'm not kind of aware of those, I, but I, I would say I was perhaps aware of a couple of instances where perhaps I think it helped um, being female and being a bit more memorable. Um, I would say a bit later on, um, once I had a child, I think that's when I really noticed the kind of difference in attitudes to women with children and men and women without children. Um, and I've sort of done quite a lot of campaigning work on that in that area. But for me personally, coming into the industry, I didn't see it as a negative being female. Right, yeah, that's that's a huge um, part of this industry that is difficult to navigate um, as a woman, especially. Um, it's, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, I'm gonna bring up Faith now, um, cause she, has a couple more questions for you as well and then lauren also has some so sure. yeah we could get faith on here hopefully that's working what? yeah perfect hi faith hi i uh, just want to say thanks for answering the questions so far um find it all very very fascinating um but my next question is about why you decided to go freelance over having worked in the studio, I'm assuming on the studio books, what made you decide to go freelance and take that risk of, I suppose you don't really know what could happen next, whereas you've always got that secure payment coming in. Yeah, so the reason I went freelance, it was um, at that point, and it's still the case now, Air Studios didn't have engineers um, on salary. So the staff were all assistant engineers even though, as I kind of said before, like the guys there now, you know, they've been doing it for about eight years and they're really talented. They're engineers in their own right. But the role was of an assistant engineer. So you might pick up bits of engineering in that role. But generally, you are the person running Pro Tools. Um, whereas then, you know, I was kind of ready to do my own thing. And I got an opportunity to work with Coldplay at their studio. And that then I knew that was going to be at least a couple of months work, which is probably... I guess the kind of bit of security that I needed, I think it'd be quite hard to leave without anything in the diary. But once I had those kind of couple of months, um, which I think turned into almost a year, but at the time I thought it was, you know, there's at least a couple of months there. That was kind of the, the push that I needed um, to go freelance. And it was because I wanted to do more engineering and producing in my own right, rather than just running Pro Tools for other people. Um, so another like, lead on from that is how do you think this year has affected all the freelance workers within the entire industry 
because uh, as my job, I work in um, online retail sales of instruments. And I've noticed that in the section where I work as the returns, we've had quite a few people who've worked in the industry who've not got the work in at the minute, having to come and find a job where they're getting nine to five hours. Yeah, I mean, the crisis has been disastrous for the music industry, um, particularly those that are reliant completely on live stuff. I mean, there's, and the ones that haven't got any support from the government. Obviously there's some self-employed people that have got support from the government. A lot of employees have been able to be furloughed, but there's, it's about 30% of, I think it's 30% of MU members, about 38% of MPG members have all fallen outside of those criteria that get support. So they're probably limited company directors or started their business too soon, or have got a kind of portfolio career where they don't meet any of the thresholds. Um, and for those people that are in live events, they've had literally no income and it's been disastrous. Um, studio side of things, certainly the largest studios have still been able to continue working. And certainly after the summer, there was definitely a few months where it seemed like everyone was trying to cram in their sessions while they could. I know that obviously this latest lockdown has again led to some people cancelling. And I think the people that work with up and coming bands and perhaps amateurs as well. I think they found it really hard because again, obviously amateurs aren't allowed to go out and do just do sessions for fun. You can only do sessions if they're professional at the moment. So that's been really hard. Um, yeah, I think all around it's been pretty devastating. I think in a way the recording industry has been luckier than the live industry because we can still work, but you know, no doubt about it. I think everybody's suffering. How quick do you think um, the industry will bounce back after COVID and after lockdown? Do you think it'd be a long process or do you think it'll be a process that takes a fair bit of time? I think the big live events will take some time. I mean, ideally, we'd like the government to ensure live events going forward. I think it will be I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether we will get the large scale live events this summer or not. Um, I think again the kind of the really big big scale things the big artists the big labels they will survive and they'll have the resources to come back at, you know at whatever point it's safe to come back but it's the more grassroots side of things that you know anything can tip them over the edge so if they don't get this visa thing right allowing you know our UK artists to tour the EU and vice versa that could have a real impact on grassroots um, artists and then it has another impact on the kind of grassroots studio side of things. It feels like definitely the kind the people that are in normal times are on like middle incomes or low incomes. It's going to be incredibly hard for them to come back unless they get the right support and the government makes the right decisions. I think for the higher end of things, I think they'll be OK, whatever happens. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Faith. Um, I do have a couple of other questions in the Q&A, but we're going to have to move on to Dom now with um, Lauren. And then at the end of the session, we'll bring both of you back and ask a couple more questions from the audience. Um, so thank you so much for um, taking this time to talk with us. It's been really, help really helpful and really cool to see. Um, so if you want to We'll both hit our cam and, and mics and then we'll bring them in. But thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Cheers. Awesome. Oh, hi. 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 Can you hear me? I can, yeah. How cool. are you? Good, thank you. Very good. Great. Uh, so um, I'm just going to read out the uh, the bio from the um, program just to give you a bit of okay. yep. background information on Dom. <laughs> Uh, you're a Grammy-winning producer and mixer. You have your own studio in Oxfordshire. Is that where you are now, or like a home yeah. studio? The studio, yeah. Great. Um, worked with a huge number of big names: Amy Winehouse, Mark Ronson, Adele, Morrissey, Estelle, Sting. The list goes on and on and on. It's very impressive. Um, I guess what we'd like to start off with asking is how did it all begin? And what got you into producing in the first place? Um, I guess probably like most people that end up where I am, I started off in like a band as a teenager. Um, and 
I didn't really like the gig bit of it, like playing, it didn't really interest me, but I really liked the studio side of things. Um, when I say studio, we had a four track cassette recorder, you know, mm. but I played with it for ages. And then, and then I saved up and saved up and then got an eight track. And then I discovered that there was this job called sound engineer from a book I got out in the library um, because it was, you know, this is kind of pre-internet really, cause I'm that old. Um, so I got this book out of the library that described sound engineer. So then I, um, I'd literally knocked on the doors of a lot of studios. I wrote down a list of studios in London. I knocked on the doors of dozens of them over three days with nothing much more than um, I'll work for nothing, I make great tea. That was like my killer line that I thought would get me in, <laughs> which it didn't, <laughs> that didn't work. Um, so then um, I'm not really one to take a no, really. I just keep going until I find a yes. So then I went to Birmingham being the next biggest city and somebody there said, yeah, all right, come in on Monday. Um, so then I went in and and back then you could kind of sign on for unemployment benefit and you could just get by. I mean, I was like 20 or 19, 20 um, and I got housing benefit and unemployment benefit. And that was just enough to live on if you didn't really want to do anything ever apart from sort of sit in the studio and, and drink the free tea and eat eat like peanut butter on toast for every meal. Yeah. So I did that for a few, for a few months um, and then I got a job. A job came up. Um, that was for a friend of the guy who was the client of the, in the studio at the time. And that sort of got me on a roll. Then it was a job for a, a studio called Depp, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now a car park. But um, it was it belonged to UB40, who were a big band in Birmingham at the time, you know, as, as they still are, I guess. Um, so that sort of got me started. And then I, I moved down to London and got a job at a studio called Metropolis, which is quite a big one. And, and then I've been freelance for about 12, 14 years, something like that. Huh? Um, and apart from obviously trying to find a studio to be able to work in, maybe as well with setting up your career, what was the biggest challenge that you faced and how did you overcome it in the early years? Mm, early years, I guess there's kind of not really knowing what I was doing. And, and that's that that's in terms of like how to build a career as well as what to do in a studio. So you kind of you just end up having a stab at things and hoping it works out. And I think that the best bit of advice in terms of that um, is that the sort of thing that I cling to is a Winston Churchill quote, which was success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And that's really described my career because I've failed an enormous amount of times, but it never bothers me. I just, I either go again or I think of something different and I do that instead. And I just keep on, uh, keep on going with a lot of enthusiasm. So I think that's always the biggest challenge when you're starting out is like, is this going to work? Is this, uh, is, is this the right move? And I think if you just approach everything with a lot of enthusiasm and try and be as helpful as you can to the people around you, then that's sort of, that, that is sort of catching, you know, and, and people pick up on that and then they want to help you and they want to have you around, you know, when they're doing stuff. If they need another body, then then they get you in because you were the one who was enthusiastic and helpful and 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 you know and useful. So um, so regardless of the fact that you know I may not have technically known much at the beginning because I didn't do a course or anything like that. It's just what I'd learned in my bedroom. Um, people were happy to have me around and teach me what I needed to know because they knew that I would be keen to learn. And you know that enthusiasm was obviously something that people picked up on. Cool. Uh, some, something a lot of people say in the industry is that you face a lot of no's and a lot of fall throughs. Would you say that that's kind of shaped your career and like guided you to where like you've ended up? Or yeah, you... I've just ended up <laughs> on the, the yeses. Whatever the yeses were, that's what I went with. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I say, I've tried a load of things that didn't work, and and I I, I keep on trying loads of things that don't work, and. Um, uh, but some of them have, you know, there's enough that have worked over the past 25 years that I'm still here and, and doing something similar to what, you know, I set out to do. So so that's a good thing. Yeah. What would you say um, would be the advantages and disadvantages of working in like a bigger studio like you have now as opposed to like a home set up? Okay, um, so working, do you mean when you say in a studio, you mean like in a commercial studio as opposed yeah, to yeah. working in it? Okay, uh, well, advantages of the commercial studio are um, you, you get to know people, like the, the clients that come through can be very, very useful um, because, and, and another quote from somebody, this wasn't Churchill, I don't know who said this, was um, people hire the best person they know at the job, 
that they like working with. Mm. So, you know, you, you see this sometimes the Hollywood actors who are great and then disappear because they ended up actually they're awful people. And then you see people that are kind of OK, like Paul Rudd, who's in every single film because he's obviously such a nice bloke. Everyone wants to hang out with him. So I think that that's a useful thing by being in a, in a commercial studio is that you get to meet a lot of people and make a lot of friends. And then if you can prove yourself technically as well, then that gives you a lot of opportunity to progress your career. Um, the 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 advantage the the other side of it the disadvantage which is the advantage of being at home is that you do sit there and just make tea for a very long time so you know i was making tea for years and i started off in debt i was in debt for two years and i progressed to mostly engineering by doing and doing a little bit of assisting mostly engineering kind of mixing it up and then i went to metropolis and i didn't engineer for about another two or three years i was just i was bottom of the pile again just making tea um, and, you know, patch cords and all the usual assistant kind of jobs. But it's, you know, you, you really um, you kind of pay your dues when you're working in a large studio. So so if you're if you're on your own, uh, if you're able to network well in your own studio and, and put the effort into networking, then then I think that you've got an opportunity for a possibly quicker progression because you are hands on making records every day rather than just watching other people do it. Right. So. Uh, I've got a question from Matt here. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you want to come up, Matt. Is that all right? Is that any better? Ah, glorious. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so my question is, when you when you went around um, knocking on these different studio doors, um, what were the main things that you uh, took out of it, uh, like the is looking for? So, so when you know when when uh, when you're going around knocking, what do you think the um the main um, skills and and then personality traits they're looking for when when employing new people? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure they are, and and I think all I did was I I kept on going until I got lucky. Mm. I think that's that all that happened. But I think that that sort of persistence is is part of the key to it because having then worked in studios and seen how they hire. Um, and, and what they do, like at Metropolis, for example, they would get probably a dozen, two dozen CVs a week from people who wanted to be an assistant. Now, there were no jobs. We never advertised jobs, but there would still be CVs in every week of people who wanted to do it. And the, the studio manager or assistant manager would keep them in a file. And every sort of month or two, she would just ditch the, the oldest ones and assume that those people have probably done something else. Mm. Right. So, so the key on, on that really to play that game is to keep finding reasons to get in contact. Mm. You know, if you're looking for a job in the studio, send a send a CV in or with a, some covering letter of this is what I've been up to every month or every other month so that you'll be on the top of the pile. And I know the reason why I got an interview was because I, I, I put um, I put a CV on on the right week and it was a week some guy left. And so mm. then they started shipping looking through the CVs that week and and I was one of them so I got a call and actually I didn't get that job interestingly mm. enough I didn't get the first job I went for because it was for something called uh, a cabling assistant I didn't know what that means mm. and that's just like probably a metropolis specific title um so I turned up saying how I've been doing a lot of you know engineering and you know experience yada 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 and then they said oh right you're not going to want this one because this is like a low position and you're not even in the studios you're just fixing cables and then I tried to reverse it with like, oh, well, I want to say a bit experienced. You know, I've got a lot of holes in my, you know, a lot to learn. Yeah. Uh, but that didn't work out. But what it meant was um, I obviously gave a reasonably good impression. And six weeks later, when somebody else left and they needed to put someone in the studio straight away, they gave me a call and asked if I wanted to come in for that one. So, mm. uh, so that kind of worked out in the end. But uh, yeah, it was a bit disappointing. At that. So, and I got a parking ticket for the same thing because they kept me waiting hours so um, persistence and 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 like letting them know that you're still interested you're still like looking at, yeah they like... won't assume after six months of seeing a cv that you still want the job. Mm. you know they'll have done something else so it may be you've got a part-time job in a shop or something and you're still trying to get assistant jobs mm. or what I would advise is you're at home making records trying to make a living and, and start getting some income going that way while still applying for assistant jobs mm. and just you know play both games see which one you mm. end up being lucky on and and um so just one quick question and That's having fine. like a little portfolio i guess if, if you make music on your own um would that you think help you get a job in in those studios it depends on the studio if they're if it's a small place 
and they're looking for somebody that could possibly engineer as well. So like when I was at Depp, the smaller studio, it was it was two rooms, but it was, you know, an outside London sort of thing. Then the fact that I was engineering within six months wasn't that unusual. And, and they might want someone that knows what they're doing to some extent. Uh, with Metropolis, that wouldn't have made any difference at all. They didn't care because they knew that they would be teaching me everything I needed to know. And I wouldn't be touching any bit of gear for a couple of years anyway, mm. you know, so, so for, it just I, I would I would gauge it depending on the studio. OK, all right. thank you very much, Tom. Just the only reason why I just put an add on to that. If you were to send one to a big studio that was just looking for someone to make tea, the fact that you are saying I'm very experienced might count against you because they might say he's going to get bored like I did with the first job I tried to get. Mm. Fair enough. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you, Dom. Cool. Great. Uh, I think it might be time to move on to the dreaded subject of COVID and how you might have adjusted this year to the lockdown, um, how you've been working with artists. Have you been doing, say, like remote recording, collaborating online and things like that? Just how's it gone, basically? Um, yeah, it's it's obviously weird. Um, it's uh, the, the, I'm, I'm mostly sort of, I've done uh, quite a lot of mixing and, and I just sit here on my own for mixing anyway, you know, the sort of people that do a lot of mixing, it's, um, there's no difference. We've been self-isolating for years. We're really good at it. So um, that has thankfully continued is what I'm doing today. You know, it's, it's still, there's still stuff going on like that. The sort of production stuff that I do has uh, obviously been much more challenging and I've done much less of it. Um, I did some sessions in sort of in between the lockdowns over summer, I had quite a few little things that went on there, which was good. So I managed to keep that going. Apart from that, I've saw, I'm have i sort of quite a portfolio career person anyway. I've, I've always kind of been tempted by new and interesting things, uh, which I think is what's kept me going, you know, because I've, I've normally got something going on, you know, some sort of income stream somewhere. So I have, um, a couple of years ago, I started this thing called The Mixed Consultancy, which is a website and that helps it's part of my education thing. I, I, I do guest lectures and, yeah, you know, this sort of stuff. I have a few questions um, about that, actually. Oh, okay. Well, it's sort of, it allows people to upload okay. their mixes to me and and I give them a load of feedback on how they can get better at it. Um, but that's actually, that's picked up over, over this time and it's taken up a little bit more of my time because obviously there's a lot more people sat at home learning how to do it. You know, they've got a bit more free time if they've been furloughed. So, so there's quite a bit more of that. So it's a case of... I already had a fairly portfolio career and and the weight of it has shifted around to mixed consultancy mixing away from producing um so yeah kind of just a bit of moving around really uh, um sorry for this short notice um, angelo but could we get corbin up to ask about he has a question about the uh, mixed consultancy My mic is off. I'm already on the thing, actually, so I'll just pop up. Right. <laughs> um, so just um, as regards um, the mixed consultancy, which is um, your sort of, I want to say project, but that sounds like the wrong word. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting way that you can sort of support um, like bedroom producers, really, and that they can always come to you and, and ask for advice and, and get a consultancy on, on their mixes and everything. Um, do you sort of think that 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 bedroom producer method is is the future of music production or do you still think that in say 10 15 years time there'll still be definitely a place for established studios um going forward or do you think it's more leading towards that sort of independent way of, of doing things i think it'll always be a mixture i think that there's um you know there's always uh, a desire for people to work in bigger studios and um and commercial ones um, they they don't need to anymore like they used to. That used to be a, a it wasn't an option, which is why there were so many, which was great. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case now because I like big studios. I think they're nice to work in. It's good to turn up and only think about the music because everything else is being done for you. Um, so that that's nice. But um, but you know, so I use them for bigger recording sessions like like drums and strings and things like that. I'll use commercial studios and everything else that like I'm just sort of sat in here and I've got a piano and vocals and some boxes, which I should have tidied up before the call. Um, so um, I, I can do any overdubbing and mixing in this room. So, you know, I think it's always going to be a balance. I don't think one is going to ever give out because different people like to work in different ways. Uh, hopefully 
you know, there's been since I started in the 90s, there's been a huge gutting of the number of commercial studios. Hopefully we're, we're at an equilibrium now where, where we won't see many other closures and, and we can kind of, there's enough work to keep the ones that are around going because, you know, they're great, they're great facilities and it's great to go in there and, and, and get really good recordings from professionals and people that know what they're doing. So, um, yeah, but that's sort of the, the, the existence of the bedroom producer is one of the reasons why the mix consultancy exists definitely is because I know I was very lucky to have spent a lot of time in big studios while I was learning asking people that I was working with um, that were coming in. And I just thought I'd make, you know, try and make a little bit of a difference in, in offering that to people. You know, if you want to ask someone who's been doing it for 25 years, then I'm one of those people and you can ask me. So yeah, that was definitely idea. beats sort of going on internet forums and posting things and saying just to, to everyone, like it, yeah, you, you get much of a better sort of service with it. I think thanks. Thanks for answering the question. I appreciate it. Cool. Great. So um, I was thinking of moving on to kind of how you structure and organize your products. Firstly, do you prefer to take on quite a lot at the same time or like a few at the same time? Or do you kind of concentrate on one until it's finished and then move on to the next? I'd like to concentrate on one until it's finished and then move on to the next. Um, but life doesn't really work like that, unfortunately. So you end up doing like a little bit of, you know, you end up having to juggle a little bit. So you, you're working on a mix for a bit, but you know, the like with me that day, I need some mix consultancy stuff back to somebody because I always try and get it within two working days. So there's always stuff like that ticking on. And then you might get an email from someone saying that mix you did last week could have another version of the high up or something like that. So, so that's why I run, um, you know, I'm sort of, I've obviously got quite a lot of analog gears. You might be able to see behind my chair, mm -hmm. um, but I run it. Um, I, ha I use the Mackie, uh, sorry, the Neve line mixer um, to run everything through. Um, and so I can do a recall within about four or five minutes. I can be in another mix making a change and then back to this one five minutes mm -hmm. later so that I can jump. And so I do jump around out of necessity rather than out of uh, choice because I prefer the kind of focus of just doing one thing and, and sticking to it. But um, but that's that's not how life is. So there right. we go. Um, Shannon has also got a question about your uh, organisation of your project. So I think she's coming up on okay. the call as well. Hello. 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 Um, I'd like to ask, as a freelancer, um, how do you like to structure your workload so that um, you have a structured and steady uh, load of work, but you want to have like the flexibility and creative freedom to not kill that, kill your spark and to work at your best? Because it is creative work and you need that room. How do you manage that with a, um, as a freelancer? Uh, so I missed the first bit because it was breaking oh, up and going. Uh, sorry. Um, um, as a freelancer, how do you um, like to keep the structure to your work to your workload uh, whilst having the flexibility um, to work? Yeah, be creative and yeah, got it. I got the end bit, so I was just checking on the first bit. Uh, so uh, I sort of well, see. I'm a freelancer, but you know, I'm I'm also I'm the structure is somewhat determined by a couple of things. And one is whatever a client's deadline is. And when I said I would deliver something by, and also the fact that I have three kids of school age. So there's a certain amount of stuff I have, to do, you know, particularly at the moment, because I'm home homeschooling them, which is very, very difficult. Um, so I think that the thing about creativity is, um, and I've been reading a lot about this lately. Um, uh, and it's something that, that there's a uh, here I am with another quote Picasso said inspiration exists but it has to find you working and, and I think creativity comes out of habit and if you just sit down and do the work and put the time in every day it tends to just come through constantly doing it um, mm -hmm. it's like if you sit around and wait for I'm going to sit around and wait for some interesting ideas to come and then when I feel the urge I'm going to start doing I'm going to start a mix or I'm going to start doing some keyboard lines or something like that then i think you can wait forever i think the best thing to do is just start and then the process and going through and, and having ideas and eliminating them it starts the creativity working up so so in terms of structuring it my day becomes structured around whatever needs to be done and the hours that i have to do it in and the creativity and, and inspiration comes by just sitting down and working and, Work then, first. and then those things 
definitely yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. that actually sounds like a really yeah. good idea because if you have an idea whilst you're um not moving as such um your motivation kicks in but if you're already working then you either take it or you leave it and i suppose do you feel more critical whilst you're on a roll yeah i think so yeah yeah but i'm also always prepared to come back the next day i think that's a really good idea reflection um, i recently read yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's also sleep. Sleep is a hugely important thing because your the creative part of your brain goes does a lot of work while you're asleep. Your brain doesn't really shut off when you sleep. It's just other parts of your brain are busy that yeah. are not part of your conscious. I struggle a lot with There's sleep. Book- I, I I'm always having too many ideas when I'm going. To, I take like hours. <laughs> like, I've worked uh, myself. But if you're interested in um, if you're interested in creative process, there's a book called Rest, which I strongly recommend because it talks about how you should structure your life Uh, in terms of being creative and it's all about the when you rest and leave your brain to do the work do you know who that's by i'm just noting it down sorry i don't and it's a very long name but if you look up rest it's a blue book with like a deck chair on the front and then that's the one it's great okay thank you very much no problem Uh, okay um so this question was also asked to Olga in the last talk, but um, what would you say were some of the differences and similarities of working with kind of smaller, more independent artists and then those that are in sort of the top 1% of the industry, things like that? Um, yeah, it's a diff. I got asked this recently on something else that I was doing. I can't remember what it was, but... Mm-hmm. Um, they were asking whether it was more stressful or something. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's not, it's just different. Mm. It's different because there were different pressures that those those people are under. So if you're working with a, a new band, then their stresses are, they sort of got no idea if this plan that they've got is gonna work out, you know, is this, um, and so there's, there's a lot of kind of introducing a calming atmosphere of, you know, let's, let's just do it. Let's see where the creativity takes us. Let's ju- go through the process and trust in the process. And, you know, there's a reason why we've all got this far. So let's carry on with where we are, you know, now. Uh, and just having a, a sort of trying to be as, as calming an influence as possible so that they, they can they can move through the process with confidence. Um, so that's kind of the difficulties with, with newer acts is really that kind of confidence level. Um, with people that are more experienced, I mean, sometimes you get confidence issues with people more experienced, but it's much more rare. Um, but there's much more pressure on uh, on a bigger act to deliver because it's not just their careers that hinge on it. It's, you know, lots and lots of careers. You know, if you're if you're on a major label and you're the main artist that delivers, you know, it's like U2 with Ireland. It's like that used to be their whole financial report was built around I, uh, U2's album structures and when they were going to be released. So <laughs> with, 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 with bands like that, um, it's there's, there's there's different pressures and and it's and it's to be honest it's the same process from my point of view of being uh you know a calming influence that just trusts in the process and gets the job done and and you know allows everybody to feel how they need to feel and do what they need to do but at the end of the day we, we keep recording and we keep working so it's sort of it's similar and it's different at the same time my approach has always been similar in that i try and be the same guy regardless um, even though I realise that they're coming from different areas in terms of stresses. So I know one of the roles of a producer is to kind of have an input on the track as well and help it to be, I guess, not too busy and to kind of, you know, make it good for recording and mixing. Um, would you say you had, mm-hmm. you did that more with like the smaller artists to try and kind of tailor it to be better for um yeah probably because they're probably looking for it more um the 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 newer artists are probably looking for more input um than somebody who's been around the block a lot and they don't really need it because they are um they're in a different place and they're used to doing this sort of thing whereas with the smaller you know with the newer bands and they're they're finding their sound and they're finding their place so there might be a bit more kind of kind of help that they would want or a bit of nudging in a certain area um and, and knowing how to sound like themselves if that mm-hmm. makes sense i mean it's, it you know it might sound quite odd to not know how to sound like yourself but it's sort of it's drawing out from them what it is that's signature about them 
which somebody who's made 10 records doesn't need doesn't need to know that because they know that already so there's a bit i suppose there's a bit more of that yeah right uh, am i right in thinking you've done lots of sound design as well uh, i've done a bit yeah i've done a few sort of sample packs and things with uh you know in various you can go to donmorley.com do you want to talk about kind of your process behind that and the sort of equipment and plugins that you'd usually use to yeah so so the what the things that i've done it's kind of playing to your strengths a little bit so i've done a lot of synth sample packs mm. which is you know so so uh so it's, the thing that i can see is you know what i offer more uniquely is a lot of analog synthesis because all of this behind me is analog all this modular stuff so so um i just my, my sort of idea was well that's what i can do better than a lot of people so why don't i just try and be as clean and pure in terms of getting a good analog synth sound in and then letting people play with that afterwards so i've always just built big sound libraries of, of various different whatever creations i can make on this and then and then try to keep it as pure and and straight as possible so that into a nice di and that's it no processing no anything because i think that can be done afterwards uh in the box by other people what i can offer is the analog starting point which is the, the you know the the strength that i have i do have a little question from nina here that says if you have time mm -hmm. i'd love to know what mm -hmm. that wiry synth thing is behind dom that is a big modular system so here we've got some moog format stuff which is 5u um next to that i've got a little bit of euro rack up at the top that's euro rack this is 50s valve test equipment which um, looks beautiful, but does very little. That one does a sine wave very, very, very well. Uh, but that's all it does, a sine wave. Uh, here we have something called Buchler, which is another format of modular. And that's Surge, which is another format of modular. Those two are for you. So they're just loads of different modular synths. Perfect. Um, any kind of older artists like Police and... Um, then like newer, well, more modern sort of artists like Verdi and the Verb and that. Is there other differences between uh, those apart from, I guess, the technology is the main one? Yeah, I mean, um, from my point of view, again, it's a bit like the newer artist and the older and the uh, and more established one, the, the, older, the older guys you know, coming with a sense of a certain amount of confidence and experience and know what they're doing. So you just need to help them deliver their thing. Whereas the newer ones, you just have to be a bit more careful about um, about confidence crises, is really. I think that's that's crises. That's more what happens with the newer ones. So you're you're working with that a bit more. Um, but that's really the only difference. I mean, if, from from the, the point of view of what I do is, you know, I still I'll still treat everyone the same and, and do the same job, hopefully, with everybody regardless. So so there's just the psychology is slightly different, but um, but it's, no, it's not a big thing that anyone needs to particularly pace themselves about, to be honest, because as long as you sort of try and see things from the artist's point of view regardless, you know, what, no matter what's going on, if you're always trying to see things from their point of view and how they can have a more enjoyable time and a more creative time, then you're always going to do the right sort of thing. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Cameron Smith. Come in now. I'll be on the call in a sec. Hi. Hello. Uh -huh. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, for students who are wanting to get into modular synthesis, I was wondering what one piece of equipment would you recommend looking at and maybe affordable slightly as well? Well, you know where I would start? is the uh, is the um, the virtual stuff um, because that's a really good way to see if that's the sort of thing you actually enjoy doing because once you get into the physical stuff it can get expensive so I would start with something like I think it's called uh, VCV virtual mm -hmm. um, control virus VCV which I think might even be free um, and there's all sorts of stuff that you can do there and they're all sort of replicas of the stuff that you get in the real world so if you have a play with that see if you actually enjoy doing it and if it's something you find inspiring. See, the, the reason why it works for me is because I like getting away from a screen. So that's why I started doing it. And then I, and I like synthesis and I like the sort of physical patching. But but that the the virtual stuff didn't exist for me when I started. And that would have been a good way to see if I actually like the, the process of patching things and creating my own synth sounds 
in that way rather than starting with a nord or or with a you know a profit mm. or something like that and get that way so so i'd go like that and then if you like it start with eurorack because eurorack has a lot of options and there's a lot of quite cheap ones as well so start with that and start very is that, very is that the simple. behringer stuff the, as well the behringer do yes. eurorack stuff yeah it's all the three yes. u high stuff that's all eurorack yeah so it's um if you start with that start, just get a, a handful of things and buy them all secondhand because the chances are you'll sell it all within a year and get some other stuff because your your goals will have changed and you'll learn a lot more about it and know more what you want to do. I bought a whole load of Eurorack when I started in one go and I have one module left from the stuff that I bought. I must have bought 30 or 40 modules to start out with. It was stupid. Um, so yeah, buy secondhand, get a few things uh, and and go from there, build slowly and then you'll, you won't make the mistake. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I was thinking we could go back to your website and talk about that a little bit more. Um, and the fact that you mentor mm -hmm. as well, uh, master's students at Leeds College, is that right? Yeah, so uh, Leeds Conservatoire, I'm one of the tutors for the master's course in music production. So yeah, that's sort of a bit of a part-time gig that I've been doing for, I think it's four and a half years now. Oh, fabulous. And what, why did you start the website in the first place? Was it kind of motivated by, you know, your experience when you were younger and trying to? Yeah, it's a combination of things. There's one of them, the, there's two main reasons. One one is I felt like I sort of touched on it a bit earlier. Like um, I was obviously working with students. I'd started working with the students at Leeds at that point. Um, and, 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 and it was going quite well. And I thought this is, this is, uh, this is a good thing to do. You know, I was doing guest lectures as well and, and, and was enjoying the sort of education aspect of what I do and wanted to be able to find a way to extend that to people that couldn't afford due to time or money to be in full time education, because that is quite a luxury mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And not everybody can. So um, so what I wanted to do was provide just something that could help people in a small way that they could kind of come to ad hoc whenever they wanted. Um, and then the reason why I chose the sort of mixed feedback thing that I that I have done as, as a way of doing that is there was a session that I did when I was an assistant and almost an engineer. I was doing little bits of engineering, but wasn't full time. Um, and it was for quite a big band and they were getting all of their uh, their two inch tapes archived to digital. We were putting it all into Pro Tools and this band wanted a little rough mix of every track when it went in just so they could remember, you know, stuff songs they'd forgotten over the years. Uh, there was sort of several decades worth of work um, and there were three studios working in metropolis i was assisting in one room and there was a producer who was also a mix engineer overseeing the whole thing and the guy i was assisting was ill for two or three days and the producer who i knew quite well said right don why don't you just take over for a few days get the rough mix going and then i'll come in and just sort of finish it off so i had the opportunity to sit there and try and get this mix sounding as good as i possibly could and then somebody with 20 years experience on me sat down and in 20 minutes did it much better. <laughs> so I was like, you know, over his shoulder going, what's he doing? What's he changing? That I thought was good that is now yeah. so much better. And I learned so much in those three days of essentially having my work marked by somebody with a right. lot more experience. And my critical listening skills sort of went up quite rapidly just by being able to hear the things that he heard when he changed it. So I thought that's a good format to be able to to um, help other people out with by, you know, they send me their mix and I list like half a dozen things that I've heard that could be better that they haven't heard. And then when they, the, when they compare their mix to the change that they make, then they can go, oh yeah, I can hear that difference now and that was worth doing. And now I know to listen out for that in future. So yeah, that's, that's sort of the two sort of areas of inspiration that led Great. to me starting. Uh, we have one more question at the bottom here. Um, have you mm -hmm. had any experiences with clients where they've treated you unfairly? For example, they've not paid you or they've given you like an unrealistic deadline. And how have you managed that? How do you communicate with people that are rude? Um, I've, I, you know what, I've been very lucky. I know you get some horror stories, but um, but I, I, I've never really had anything that bad. There's stuff that you had to put up with when you work in a large studio. I was talking to a mate about this the other day where you'd 
you'd be working on a mix you'd be assisting somebody's mix till two in the morning and then the assistant then has to um after doing all that has to then like do copies for the a and r because they want five cds this was back in the days when it was all on cds and and then say oh yeah i need five cds doing and i need them for tomorrow morning so you'll have to do them tonight when everything finishes so you do mix till two you're doing two hours worth of burning these cds off so you don't leave till four put it on the desk and a week later those cds are still on the front desk and unfortunately in that situation you just have to suck it up that's just how it is and it's horrible and it's not fair uh but sometimes when somebody's paying the bills they get to you know they get to call the tune regardless of how it thinks it is and then your option when you become a freelancer is do you work with them again or not but what i would always do is make sure i delivered on the thing i said i was going to deliver on and then decide whether to work with them again or not or if i did how much i would be charging next time knowing how much effort it was going to be but i think that's the important thing to approach every gig as as a freelancer sometimes when the when the things are uh, are not what you would want you deliver it and then you move on and decide whether you want to work with them again um yeah i i can't think of anything where it's gone particularly particularly bad though apart from those sort of things where there's just a bit of slightly inconsiderate yeah great well thank you very much for answering those questions i think i'm going to propose that we bring Nina and Olga back on, and we'll have a few more questions together. Um, just because we have yeah, sure. the extra forty minutes that, unfortunately, Aubrey would have filled, but she wasn't able to make it. So I think the extra time at the end we can use for some more networking if we want to drift around between tables and just talk to students and ask and answer questions. Okay. So yeah. Yep. Perfect, uh, yeah. Olga, do you relate to anything that Thomas said or have any questions about? This? Yeah, I think probably most of that is quite similar to my experience, I think. Um, I like the, the big studio experience is probably quite similar. Again, the role of an assistant. I think we've all been there at two in the morning, then running off, printing off stems, running off CDs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you were at air, yeah. weren't you? you, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I imagine it doesn't happen anymore and people get away with that because it's just a case of sending the files, but there'll be but, something. There's, there's that, always that's... something that fills the time. <laughs> yeah. There might not be stems yeah. anymore, but th there's other stuff that people find things to fill the time. <laughs> yeah. And it's worth noting, actually, for anyone that wants to sort of get a job in a studio, it's, you know, that it's, I don't think the situation is as bad as it was when I started, but you are, you know, you're sort of owned by them to an extent. And I, I do remember the 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 timetable for the weekend and the following week was always sorted out at metropolis at six o'clock on a friday so that was the point when you found out if you had a weekend or not well, regardless of what plans you had for that night the weekend birthday nobody cares if you are needed for a session that just came in that starts tonight and goes until whenever tomorrow morning then that's what's going to happen and you can't get out of it so um, that's part of the price you pay uh, to to be in one of those places. So you kind of got to be prepared for that sort of stuff. I'm sure you did exactly the same. Yeah, you, I mean, you, were... you know, I think the managers do their best to kind of be understanding, but but yeah. that's you know, it still goes on. Ultimately, the music industry people book things really last minute, and the studios are not going to turn a client away. Yeah, yeah, and you do get people that are in a different time zone, you know, so they and they don't. Oh, move they're the that. worst. They're <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember working on an Arab session that started at seven o'clock every night and finished at seven o'clock in the morning for 21 days straight. And my neighbors were redoing their bathroom. So I couldn't complain about the noise during the day, but I didn't sleep. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that sort of stuff happens all the time. And it's just the nature of the business. And we're not the only business like that. You know, if you're a lawyer, you've got the same gig. And if you work in tough end of the financial markets, you've got the same gig. So there's a lot of other people that do the same thing. It's just, it's, it's not pretty, but it's how it is. Uh, I wanted to ask yeah. if either of you had, sorry, <laughs> uh, no, go ahead. Like a favorite project or a memorable one that maybe kind of broke the norms of like the usual recording process. Hmm. You go first. <laughs> um, I mean, one really fun session I did, it was probably one of the last ones that I assisted on was a C6 Steve session 
at Air in Studio One, and he was mixing in Studio One, and not a lot of people mix in Studio One. Um, it hasn't got the most neutral monitoring. Um, you know, if you know the room, you can get used to it, but it's not what you'd say was like one of the best mix, mix rooms in the world. Um, but it has got a really amazing vintage need desk. Um, and C6 Steve was actually a sound engineer at one point in his career. So he just, you know, he just loves gear. He just wanted to work on that desk. And he brought his two, two inch tapes that he'd recorded in his front room in Devon or wherever it was, somewhere in the countryside. Um, and we just mixed, we uh, desperately scrolled through the manual of the automation because I hadn't used it in about five years like before they came in um and yeah we mixed mixed this whole album off two inch tape using the automation did quite a lot of overdubs in the main studio just with like one or two mics and it was him and vance powell who's an amazing amazing american mixer um and it's just one of those fun fun sessions they're like two of the loveliest people that i've ever worked with um they brought in one of their engineers from the states as well Another young guy and we just had a really lovely time and c6 steve is like he is on telly and there's lots of chat about moonshine and grits and lots of stuff from the deep south i had no idea what they were talking about um and it's a really fun session and i learned loads as well cool um i i would actually say again and for the same sort of community reasons that 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 one where i um where i got thrown in to do the the rough mixes and and uh and learned a lot and it's partly because i learned so much it was such a rewarding experience but also when you've got um three rooms in in somewhere like metropolis working all at once so three engineers three assistants and and the uh and the producer it's quite a community thing and no artist because they weren't really that interested it was just a sort of partly an archiving job so so we we got to set our own timetable and everyone have lunch and dinner together and it was a really good sort of um about a month or two months of um, everybody sort of being a good team. It was a, yeah, it was a really good time. So yeah, I'd say that that was. A what was the artist? Who was the artist? Secret. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you later. The <laughs> enemy. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. Olga, there were a couple of questions about, um, and I'm interested in this as well. Since you're originally from German, Germany, um, do you are you fluent in German, and how has that sort of affected your career? Has that helped at all being bilingual? Yeah, I mean, I've not used it a huge amount of times, but occasionally um, I have little. Whenever Hans Zimmer is over, I have little chats in German with him just to like, annoy the rest of the control room. Um, I've I've done one or two gigs in Germany. I've worked with a. Uh, German composer a few years back and that most of that project was done in German um, I was just mixing at his studio and then I did another one quite recently actually this summer in Berlin and it was weird because the session the composer was English the conductor was Spanish orchestra was German um, and we ran we ran the session in English in the control room but then when I started talking to the engineers I'd speak to them in German it was kind of weird like multilingual session um, so yeah, I use it occasionally, but I don't think it's essential in my work. I mean, they all speak really great English over there, so it's not, you know, I wouldn't say it was essential, but it's quite fun sometimes, quite useful on occasion. Oh, cool. Nice. There's a question here from Corbin that he asked Olga in the first session, but he'd like to direct it towards Dom as well. Is there a question that you never get asked in interviews that you always want to answer? Um, I'm normally sort of, because I'm a shameless plugger, I'm normally looking for a shameless plug for the mix community, but I got one this time, so that's fine. <laughs> um, uh, no, apart from that, I think people normally cover how you start out, and I think that's a really important question to get asked is how did you start, because I think we all took a different route into the industry, um, and I think the more of those kind of routes that you can hear, and more of those stories that you can hear, the, the more chance that you might come across something as you're getting in and go, oh, that person did that when this happened to them. So maybe I'll try and do that too. So um, that's always a good one. But but normally that gets covered. So and, and we did hear. So yeah. that's cool. uh, I think we have Faith coming up again soon, just to ask a few more questions. That's right. Yeah, Faith, if you want to come up, um, 
again, then we can ask, she has a question about um, studio etiquette as well. That's okay, subject. So, um, so yeah, my question was, um, because Don, you started off uh, without an education and kind of just got launched into studios. And then Ola, you got into through education, then started in studios. How did you find that the etiquette within the studio changed? Or do all studios expect the same kind of etiquette? And was it a natural thing that you guys had to learn? Or did somebody go, look, don't do this, this, this and this? Do you want to take this one first, Dom? Okay. Um, yeah, there was a difference. So, so I, I worked in the small studio in Birmingham, um, and then a big, sort of big posh London one, and and it's a bit more structured in the bigger posh London one. Um, there's a bit more, um, well, there's a bit more separation and, and clear roles. Um, to be honest, it, it, I think I, I think I always navigated it reasonably well. Um, I think I occasionally got, when I first started in the one in Birmingham, I occasionally got a raised eyebrow from the engineer when I obviously said something I shouldn't have said. Um, but generally, uh, my, my way of navigating it was uh, I, I would, I, I got told, you know, don't offer an opinion on, on what they're working on in terms of the musicality, because that's not what you're there for. And it'll only confuse matters to have another one there that doesn't help. And, but occasionally you get asked, which is tricky. So the way I navigated it was I would rephrase what the producer said. If I if I was forced to give an opinion, then I figured I'll just say what he said in a different way and look like that was what I agree with. And then because um, I saw him as my best route to getting more work, you see, I might get some engineering with this guy if he likes me. So if I just rephrase his stuff, then he's going to think, yeah, he's pretty sound. So um, that's what I would do. That that's sort of the stickiest situation if you get kind of put on the spot in that respect uh, um, to to answer a question you're not supposed to be answering. Um, but yeah, there is a slight difference. It's a bit more relaxed in, in the smaller studios and it's a bit more formal in, in the other studios, in, in more expensive ones. Um, but that's all I felt really. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a case of don't speak until you're spoken to, but it's just a case of being aware of what's important in the room and what's happening now and therefore helping that move along rather than 10 on a joke or something like that when everyone's trying to get something done. You know, if everyone's sitting around telling jokes, then tell a joke. But uh, but if everyone's trying to work, then that's not the right time. Which you just, you know, a little bit of empathy and, and awareness of what's going on, and, and it's not that challenging. Yeah, I mean, quite well, similar, really. I remember um, when we were at uni, sort of getting ready to go on our placements, we would be kind of quizzing the older students that had already been on their placements, going, you know, what do you do? How does it work? Um, and I remember someone kind of describing that exact same scenario you're the runner you've brought in some tea and the artist asks you what you think of the track and your answer is always positive like you don't actually give an opinion you know you just go yeah it sounds great um and i hadn't really thought about that before i was like oh yeah i suppose that makes sense and then once i actually started at air again because it, it's a big studio there are older assistants that will take you under their wing tell you what to do what not to do um so i think i, do, I don't think i particularly landed myself in it you know i was quite aware and um, by the time I got there of the kind of hierarchy and of the, you know, how you're supposed to behave. Um, occasionally we have had we have had people through the door on work experience that were completely oblivious to it. Um, and yeah, they didn't really come back. <laughs> and I think at the end of the day, that, that if if you're completely oblivious to to how the room is working, you've probably not got a long career in it anyway. So cutting it short at the beginning is saving you a lot of time because, you know, the, you're dealing with a lot of sensitive, creative people and you've got to be able to kind of sense that and, and work your way, navigate your way through things that aren't being said. So um, yeah, that probably, yeah, we had the same with Metropolis. We'd have a couple of people work experience that were, you know, would just storm through and not notice anything that was happening around them. And that's, you know, that doesn't, wrong job. That's great. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Faith. Um, I guess I've I've got one more question that could be directed towards both of you as well. Um, when you're working with, there's obviously some clients you might have that uh, have had a very long um, 
very long career from like previous decades and had like a, a huge jump in their career in previous dec decades versus ones that may have um, started their career in like the past 10 years. What is it kind of like to work between those types of age groups, those different types of um, like techniques that they may have been useful uh, used to in their heyday versus now, um, then versus like more of the younger people that are coming up in the industry? I, um, I think you can kind of, you can, you can learn from both really. I'm always quite interested when an artist or a composer has come from a background that's perhaps a bit outside of mine and they've got something new to show me or something old. So it might be someone's, you know, got like a really old fashioned technique that, I mean, probably a lot of the old ones I've kind of seen through the old school guys that come through air, but you know, something, someone who's got a really old fashioned thing that they want to try that they used to do back in the sixties or at the same time, like a kid who's just done something on his laptop that's really cool with a plugin that I've never seen before. So kind of both of it can be interesting. Um, I don't think there's like a massive distinction between them, really. Cool. Yeah, I'd agree. Any, any opportunity to learn is a good day. So yeah, um, I always thought it was really interesting when you were working, you know, as an assistant or uh, when you're working with the guys that have been doing it for a while and they've got their ways of doing things and it's something I hadn't seen in a while. That was always fantastic. But yeah equally people but then what happens is because i'm quite old myself now is is people come with new techniques which is the thing that we used to do <laughs> and then that's quite funny because you go oh yeah, yeah yeah we used to do that there is a better way of doing it these days though you don't you don't need to do that anymore <laughs> so but but you know people trying things out is always good i'm sure i did exactly the same thing when i was younger as well so um and then you learn and then you do that or some adapted version of it and uh, yeah it's all good, all good i think i have one more question if uh, if nobody else has any that they'd like to put into the q a section uh do you ever find yourself revisiting things that you've done quite a long time ago and maybe seeing how you can change it or redo it or you know kind of mix it in a different way not unless anyone's paying me to do it no <laughs> Once it's done, it's done. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I guess once you've been doing it professionally for a long time, you can't really afford to kind of, you know, go digging. I've got a million other things that need doing that like, in my house, in my life. Um, I'm not about to go and um, dig out some old hard drives for something that I mixed that's been released from 10 years ago. I think when I was at college and kind of doing mixes with new bands, I definitely kind of try and keep trying to get it better. Um, and it would take me a long time and I'd still not be happy with it. But these days, no, I won't re really revisit anything unless, you know, unless someone wants me to. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I'm exactly the same. Uh, when I was, um, obviously, as I didn't go to college, my learning was was doing, um, using the studios in downtime, which we were allowed to do at Metropolis. So I would quite often come in on a Saturday and, and mix something from a while back just because and also it's like the frustration of sitting there watching other people work all week and thinking oh, i could do that better and so then i sort of i'd vent that out by coming at the weekend and doing a mix and they go oh no i couldn't do it better this sounds awful um so you know but it's all good practice um so yeah these days the only time i dig something out i, I occasionally have sort of backing tracks that i make for certain ideas or projects that then don't get used and sometimes i'll i'll see one of those and go oh i should bring that out and see if it's useful for x you know project and then and that's the only time i dig something old out and repurpose it you know you make it sound new again um but no other than that I, you know i, I don't mix for fun anymore <laughs> it's fun but i don't do it for fun i do other things for right. fun. um should we wrap up uh, maybe move on to networking yeah that sounds great um thank you guys both so much for for coming and talking to us on here yeah thank you so much yeah.